All right. I'm glad everybody's here this morning. I, um, we made it through a couple of songs, and the allergies sometimes get the best of us, but that's just the way it goes this morning. But I'm glad we've had an opportunity to just sing a couple of songs about uh, what God uh, has turned us into, who God has made us, and uh, how we got that way. It's not because we did anything really spectacular. It's because of the work of the cross. So I'm glad that we have that this morning. I'm going to pray and I'm going to get us into a message that I think um, may be enlightening for some of us and uh, may open up our eyes. God, uh, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you for a place to worship where we can come together and commune uh, with you, that we can have fellowship with each other and talk about our lives together, that we can uh, celebrate your holy communion, uh, that we can uh, remember who Jesus is. God, I thank you for the technology that allows us to be able to broadcast uh, out all over the world. Uh, I'm not a television studio, but I thank you for this ability that we have uh, through Facebook and social media that we can get the message of your glory and your grace through what Jesus Christ has done out to the world. I just pray that you would bless this message this morning and those who hear it, uh, that they might uh, become a light unto the world to display who you are living within them so that more would be drawn uh, to the foot of the cross, to where uh, Jesus uh, suffered and died, that we might be redeemed and righteous and holy and sanctified through his work. God, we thank you for all things in Christ's name. Amen. I got to go over here off camera for just a minute because I left something over here. Uh, it's my Bible this morning. Not that I'm going to be searching the scriptures because I've got them all printed out on one piece of paper, but I wanted to illustrate something with my Bible this morning about today's message, because today's message is called The Right Divide, and our main text is from 2 Timothy uh, verses uh, 2, or chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 and 14 through 19. We're going to go through the whole chapter, but I, I wanted to say that because we all have... Hopefully we all have a Bible. If you don't have one, message me and I'll get you one. Um, I will, will provide you a Bible if you don't have one. But here's, here's the deal. Uh, the Bible is split up into two segments. It's split up into the Old Testament and the New Testament. And then it's split up into more areas like all of these books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. I'm thankful that mine are all tabbed out so that I can find them a lot more easily and that I have pictures of my son in here to mark pages that I'm reading in the Bible. But we've got to get to a point where we're dividing God's word rightly. And a lot of times, you know, we, do, we divide it by the chapter or we divide it by the verse or we divide it by the testament. And, or some of us look at it and not so much by chapter and verse, but by when things happen. Like, I don't divide my Bible except for there's before Jesus died and after Jesus died section. And I divide it up by verses and chapters and stuff like that. That's what we're doing here on Sunday morning. I'm dividing up a chapter this morning for us to study from. But unless we understand that there is a specific point in this book where Jesus went to the cross, suffered and died, and rose again... We don't have the ability to rightly divide God's word. That's just the way I see it. You may have heard differently. You may have heard otherwise. But this book needs to be divided into the before Jesus died and the after Jesus died category. Because until we can understand that Jesus died and that a new covenant was established based on his death, his shed blood, and his resurrection, we can't understand the rest of Scripture. We can get little things and trinkets out of it, but we're not going to understand it the way God designed it for us to understand. So I'm going to open us up this morning in 2 Timothy Chapter 2, verse 15, and then we're going to read through and get back to verse 15. But I want to read this to you. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Gee, I wonder where Gary got the title for this message. It came right out of this book, right out of this particular verse of this book, of this chapter. Okay, this is where I divided it down to. But I want you to just look at this verse real quickly. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. Man, you've got to focus on that. And not like approved because I did good things, but understanding what God's book says about who you are. We just sang a song about you make everything glorious, and, and if you make everything glorious, then what am I? Well, I guess i got to be glorious too if you made everything glorious, and it's based on what Jesus Christ has done. You've got to be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed. You go to work, you do what you got to do, you, you wake up in the morning, you are a worker. As soon as you wake up in the morning, regardless of whether or not you have done anything, you are a worker as soon as you open your eyes. 
You need to understand that you don't need to be ashamed. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to worry about it. There is no condemnation for you. But I want to get into this. Rightly dividing the word of truth. This word for rightly dividing here is um, ortho to male. It's the only time it ever appears in the Bible. This is the only verse in the Bible that has this word. Isn't that cool? That's neat. I like when stuff like that happens. It means to cut straight. Bam. Proceed on straight paths to teach the truth directly and correctly. Let's not mix points. Let's not try to argue things out. Let's not try to play games with it. It is what it is, and that's all that it is. And what I'm telling you today is that the gospel is straight cut. It's easy to understand. It's simple. It's direct, and it's correct. The gospel is so easy that children can understand it. Christ says, unless you come to me like a little child, you can't inherit the kingdom of heaven. What is he saying? Man, I got to act like a baby all the time? No. What he's saying is you have to have the mindset and the faith like a child does. Kids don't question. Let me rephrase that because I have a kid and some of you have kids. I don't want to say kids don't question a lot. But kids, kids don't question their parents' authenticity a lot. Maybe I should put it that way a little bit better. Maybe, maybe it's, it's that their faith in their parents when they're younger, uh, you know, jump off the bed into my arms and I'll catch you. They have no concept of the fact that mom or dad is not going to catch you. The only understanding they have is that mom or dad is going to catch you. Some of you parents are like, man, I might have screwed up a little bit in there somewhere. I dropped one or two of them. That's okay. My kid didn't want to jump off the bed into my arms. He had zero faith in my ability to catch him when he was younger. That's just the way it goes. Some people are different. They grow up differently. They understand differently. But what this is saying is that, or what I'm saying this morning is that the gospel is direct and it's easy. Jesus Christ, the only person ever born to die, grew up, lived a perfect, sinless life, went to the cross, suffered and died, bled, shed his blood to make you right with God, was put in the grave, rose three days later, victorious over sin and death to make you forever righteous in God's eyes based on his work. That's the gospel. It's just that simple. There is nothing that you need to do in order to get right with God. God has already gotten right with you through the work of Jesus Christ through the cross. He just wants you to know it. He just wants you to understand it. He just wants you to believe it. You don't have to ask God for forgiveness. He already done forgave you at the cross. That's what the whole idea of grace is about. If you have to ask God for forgiveness, then you're doing something to earn what he has already freely given you. And you have negated the work of Christ at the cross and set it aside and said, I want to be justified based on my asking you for forgiveness, not based on you giving me forgiveness regardless of whether or not I asked you. The gospel needs to go out straight right and direct into people's hearts and say this this morning you are already forgiven whether you understand it or not whether you believe it or not whether you knew it or not you don't have to do anything to be forgiven by god he has already forgiven you that's why christ went to the cross and god designed it that way from before he created the world he already had it in his mind that you would be forgiven before you were even born that's how we rightly divide God's word. But I want to get into this chapter because I want to write, I want to read to you what Paul is saying to Timothy, who is a young minister in the gospel. And he, it, a lot of people say that Timothy kind of, he met some resistance along the way because he's a young man. He, he's not, he's not, you know, schooled like all everybody else. He doesn't understand everything like everybody else. He doesn't have, he doesn't have cred. He doesn't have, you know, PhD, MOS, uh, blah, blah, blah after his name. When he doesn't have theological degree after theological degree up there. He, he, he's just Timothy. And so he, he has this that he's got to fight against all the time. His, his, his age and his, his inadequacies as a young man who's preaching the word of God. So Paul writes in this letter. He writes him a couple of letters. But he says, he says, you therefore, my son. Paul looks at Timothy. He's like, man, you're, you're like my, my son. And you're my son in the Lord. I, I feel like I taught you everything that I could about what God has shown me, you know, through the revelation of Jesus Christ. And, and so you therefore, my son, be strong. In the grace that is in Jesus Christ. Go ahead and circle that if you're circling things in your Bible this morning. Be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. It's not anywhere else. Okay? Grace isn't found anywhere else. You can't get into God's good graces by 
doing good things. It's found only in Jesus Christ and what he has already done for you. And the things that you have heard, because that's important from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Okay? So Paul starts out, he's like, Timothy, my son, be strong in the grace that is found in Jesus Christ. He says, Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard. Remember, Timothy didn't see it. Timothy didn't experience the Damascus Road like Paul did. Timothy didn't see Jesus on the cross. Timothy is after the fact. So Paul has to tell him, speak to him, the gospel. And we know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God over and over again. So he says, be, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, I said it in front of a lot of people, Timothy, Commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You need to go out and tell others this gospel. You don't need to tell them how to be good people. You don't need to tell them how to, how to do good things. You don't need to tell them how to serve in the community. You don't need to tell them how to, how to give to a specific ministry. You need to tell them about what I have told you. That Jesus Christ bled and died for the forgiveness of your sins and made you right with God based on his work at the cross and there is nothing more that you need to do. You see, we've got it all screwed up in the church today. We think that church is all about getting together and figuring out what we're going to do for the community. Right, we're going to have a pancake breakfast to pay for this and we're going to get people together to do some ministry over here and we spend all of our time figuring out how we're going to be good people in the community so that they look at us as though we're really good, hardworking individuals and all that is good but we've forgotten what the whole message is and what the purpose of coming together as a body is. If we have 12 people or 45,000 people show up on a Sunday morning, I will preach the same message that Jesus Christ died on the cross, that you are already forgiven, that his blood has washed your sins clean forever, that you are right with God because of his perfect work at the cross and he sits forever at the right hand of the Father living to make intercession on your behalf. That is the message. I don't care how many people show up. I don't care how many people watch it. I will never tell you that you need to sign up at the church and get involved in some group that's going to go out and do something in the community. Figure that stuff out on your own time. That's not what the church is for. It's to rightly divide the word of truth and preach the gospel and proclaim it to the world. We need to get our minds off all this other crap that we're doing out there and focus and refocus again on what Jesus Christ has done at the cross. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'll jump right back in the quick. All right, I was done with that little section. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. We are all soldiers in Christ's army. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. Now, I don't get confused here. That like, oh, well, you know, don't worry about your car and your house and, and this and that. You know, you, it's okay to have those things, and it's okay to remember that you have to pay for those things. And, you know, you need to you know, you keep the lights on at home, and, you know, you've got kids that are in school, and you need to make sure that that, that goes well for them, and that, that you're providing a good environment for them to learn and all these other things. And he says, don't get entangled with the affairs of this life. Don't occupy your mind with all the stupid, silly things that are going on in the world. The, understand that they're there. Know that they exist. But don't occupy your time and your mind with all that stuff. What you need to do is you are called and committed to a specific thing. And I don't care who you are, believer, if you have put your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ and you claim him as your Savior, then you have been called into the army of God. You are now a soldier. I didn't enlist for that. I thought I dodged the draft on that one. You didn't. The moment you profess faith in Jesus Christ, you were automatically a soldier. So that gives you that gives you this. It gives you freedom from worrying about all the other stuff in the world because Jesus Christ is your leader, your king, and your general. He's he's like super patent, okay? He can do all kinds of stuff, and you don't have to worry about anything. He's got your back no matter where you go. So all you need to do is focus on what your job as a soldier soldier in his army is to do it. And Paul's writing right here. He's like, just preach the gospel. Just live out the gospel. Just, just tell people what Jesus Christ has done. Make sure that you entrust this message that you have heard to other trustworthy people, faithful men and women who will be able to teach others also, who will be able to tell their kids, who will be able to tell their families, tell their loved ones, tell their co-workers about this great and glorious ministry that God has given us, the grace of God offered through Jesus 
Christ at the cross. That's what it's all about. Okay, so don't get tangled up in the other stuff that's out there in the world. Don't worry about, oh, well, this faction over here is, is living this way, and these people over here are dressing that way, and this guy over here does this. Who cares? That's not your problem, okay? That's God's problem. Your problem is to worry about preaching the gospel, not telling your friends and your neighbors what Jesus Christ has done. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So you just right there, man. You gotta follow the rules. The rules are preach the gospel, okay? Simple. Alright? I love this next one. This next one is, is is awesome because we forget about this one sometimes. In fact, we avoid this one. A lot of churches don't even tell you this one. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Ladies and gentlemen, if these are all just metaphors of life as a Christian, okay? You're a soldier in the army. You're competing in a race, so you want to do the very best that you can as a believer. You want to, you want to promote that gospel the best and possible way that you can so that you're running that race and you're like, I got Jesus up front! I, I don't know. Okay, I like this one. The hardworking farmer. Now you're a farmer. You were a soldier. You are a runner. Now you're a farmer. Okay? Must be first to partake of the crops. Guess what? That means you need to partake of what Jesus has already done for you. You need to partake of the blessings that he's given you through the cross. You need to be the first to partake. Because if you ain't partaking, how are you going to have to give it to other people? If you're not accepting the grace of God, if you're not accepting the blessings of the cross, if you're not accepting the abundant life that Jesus Christ died to give you, how in the world are you going to be able to give it to somebody else? How in the world are you going to be able to go to somebody and tell them how awesome Jesus is when you're not even partaking? of how awesome is of Jesus Christ. You need to be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Everything that you do, everywhere that you go, in all things, may He give you understanding. When you look at the world, may you no longer look at it like somebody who is not saved. May you no longer look at it as somebody who is worried about what's going on out there, who's entangled with the affairs of this life. When you look at the world, May you have understanding in all things and see, you know what? God has, has already made a provision for me through the cross of Jesus Christ. And I know that that bad stuff is happening out there, but I know that it's not coming for me. I know that there is no condemnation for me. I know that there is no punishment for me. There's no wrath to come on me. I know that I am blessed. I know that God is going to put protection around me no matter where I go. I know that I'm going to live a long, happy, healthy, and abundant life with my family. In all things, have understanding. We drop down and Paul continues on. He says, remind them of these things. And Timothy, it's important. You've got to tell them of these things again and again. You've got to keep reminding people it's important that we continually hear the gospel. It's important that when we get together in a corporate setting or every day of the week or when we open up God's word and we look into it, that we're looking for the gospel because the gospel is where we find the life. The life is not found in all of these other things. The gospel is the life because the gospel is all about Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by him. So we need to continually focus on the gospel. Remind them of these things. Charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearer. Circle that in your Bible, okay? This is, this is talking about a bunch of useless blah, 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 blah. Don't worry about that stuff. Remind them. Charge them before the Lord not to strive about it. Don't worry about, well, he says I got to be fully dunked and he says I just got to be sprinkled dip. And, and they say I can't have meat on Friday. I got to eat a fried fish sandwich. Uh, don't worry about all of this stupid crap to no profit to the ruin of the hearers that get confused and they, they, they don't understand what's going on. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God. We started here. A worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Don't worry about this needless crap, mumble jumbo. You should live this way. You should be this way. You should act this way. You should say these things. Only worry about what Jesus Christ has done. Okay? But shun profane and idle babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness. We're going to pause for a minute. Shun profane and idle babblings. This means... Turn away from accessible, useless, empty discussions. And the word profane uh, means common. Just common, useless, accessible. The accessible is, is what I like in there because all of this 
Turn away from all of these accessible discussions. I love the fact that we can use social media to broadcast live on Facebook, but there is also a, a bad side to social media, right? All of these useless, accessible, empty discussions exist on social media. I'm just as guilty as the next person of getting involved in some of these. I almost got myself involved in one this morning. I, 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 I actually typed a response and I remember what Proverbs 49 11 says, the fool vents all of his frustrations. And when the wise man learns how to shut up, this is Gary translation, I gotta remind myself of that, so I deleted everything that I had written. Okay? Avoid, turn away from, shun profane and useless empty discussions about how people dress, about whether or not we should bake a cake for that family. Uh, about yeah, that's funny, isn't it? About 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 you know um, what, what about gun laws? Who cares? Don't worry about it. Avoid these discussions. Avoid this useless commentary. Avoid uh, well, I don't think that you should dye your hair. It doesn't. Uh, it's not appropriate in church on Sunday morning to have dye. Whatever. What are you making that face for? It's like an old man with blue hair. Okay, so. <laughs> All right, son, walk away. Turn your back on these idle. Hey, man. Well, what do you what do you think about where it, where it says in uh, back in the Old Testament that um that we shouldn't mix um cotton and and linen together? How how do you feel about that? You know, being that you're so gracie and all that, do you think that we should we should be doing? I'm not gonna I'm not getting involved in that discussion. Okay, I'm not gonna get because the Bible tells me in the New Testament, and that's the post tree part where Jesus has already died. Um, that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness sake for those who believe. So I'm not going to worry about that little section right there. Not that it doesn't exist anymore. It's just I'm not going to get involved in a useless, accept, accessible, empty discussion about it. Because neither one of us is going to win. I'm going to tell you my thoughts on it. I'm going to say, hey man, that's between you and God whether or not you want to eat a cheeseburger. That's between you and God whether or not you want to eat meat on Friday. That's between you and God whether or not you want to make that cake for those people. Okay? As for me and my house, we serve the Lord. We just look at what Jesus has done. And then I believe that Jesus has covered everybody. And, and what's between you and God is between you and God. I'm not going to get involved in your discussion. I'm not going to take the bait. Why? Because they will, they will increase to more ungodliness. Me and you are going to argue. And I'm going to get physical with you. And I'm going to win. Okay? All right? I like the back row people are laughing at that. And their message will spread like cancer. That's what happens. Okay? It tears churches apart. This is this this whole useless battling, shun profane battling, words to no profit, the ruin of the hearers. It tears apart and it kills. Their message will spread like cancer. It will eat up the body. It will destroy the body. It will separate the body. It will divide the body. I love that he gives examples of people here that have done this stuff. Hymenius and and Philetius. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Or of this sort who has strayed concerning the truth. And look what look at the, the, the message that these guys went about saying, saying that the resurrection is already past, and they overthrow the faith of some. They've gone to people and they've been like, now Jesus is already resurrected and he already took people with him. You're screwed. You know that like like really? That's gonna help people be faithful to the message of the cross? That's gonna help people. No, it's a useless thing. And if this isn't like some new argument back in Paul's day, this wasn't like, oh, they just made up this argument that the resurrection already happened or that there was no resurrection or anything like that. The Pharisees and the Sadducees argued about it all the time. Pharisees said, there's going to be a resurrection. And the Pharisees and Sadducees said, there isn't going to be a resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see? Okay? So they didn't believe in a resurrection. I'm making stupid church jokes this morning. I'm sorry. All right? But they followed each other. In fact, Paul used it against them one time when he was being accused of stuff. He was like, he was like, oh, I'm preaching about the resurrection. And so, so you know, what he, he, got them all, he got the Sadducees and the Pharisees fighting with each other, and they forgot they were mad at Paul because they were too busy fighting with each other. Paul used this, this whole idea of, of useless things to no profit to get himself out of something. Paul was a little smarter than we give him credit for. All right. Straight. All right. Concerning saying that the resurrection is already passed, and they overthrow the faith of some. They, they, they tear up the faith of some. Instead of speaking the gospel, which is the only way that faith comes, is by speaking the gospel. Instead of proclaiming the work of Christ at the cross, instead of declaring that there is going to be a resurrection of the body, that there is going to be a second coming of Christ, that He will return and reign as King over all, and that all evil and all, all wickedness will be put aside, and that every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus 
Jesus Christ is Lord. Instead of proclaiming this message, they gave up some crap message in, in, in his place and then ruined the faith of some of the people. Nevertheless, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Let everyone who knows the name of Christ depart from iniquity. This just means like stand aloof of iniquity. I, I'm not a part of iniquity anymore. Not that I don't make mistakes anymore, but I'm better than it now. I'm better than, than my sin. I'm better than the mistakes that I've made in the past. Not because I've bettered myself by being a better person. I'm better than that because of what Jesus Christ has done for me. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. It's like allow them to walk away from the iniquity that was in their lives. Don't keep bringing it back up and telling them what they ought to be doing, how they ought to be getting that out of there, how they ought to be stopping that, how they ought to be doing this, they ought to be doing that. Because all you're doing is you're bringing back the law into their lives and the strength of sin is the law and the sting of sin is death and so we know all of these things so don't do that anymore let them let everyone who names the name of Christ walk away from iniquity allow them to walk away from it preach the gospel into their lives let them understand that they are righteous regardless of what they are doing have done or will do in the future that God loves them no matter what if he didn't he would allow Jesus to go to the cross on their behalf that their sins are already washed away by his blood let them walk away from their iniquity let them stand above their iniquity let them be mounted firmly on the foundation of Christ's perfect work at the cross and stand aloof over their iniquity you ain't got nothing on me addiction I'm in Christ Jesus. He is my righteousness. He already suffered and died. He already bore the punishment for my sin. He already made me right with God forever and eternity because of what he did at the cross. He died my death. He bled my blood. He laid in my grave on my behalf and he rose victorious over my sin so that I can stand here today and say, you ain't got nothing on me addiction because I'm better than you now. I'm better than all that. Because of what Jesus has done for me, not because of what I've done for myself. Man, it's time that we start presenting ourselves approved to God. We gotta be drive time Christians. That's what we gotta be. Approved. We gotta stand up, not present myself approved based on my works, not present myself approved based on what I did or what I haven't done. I'm approved. When we come to God, when we come before his throne of grace, when we want to come boldly before the throne of grace and petition God Almighty with our needs and our wants and our desires in our lives, we've got to present ourselves approved. This is how most Christians present themselves. Oh, God, I'm not worthy. They, they're like Wayne's World Christians. I like movies. I'm sorry. They're, they're Wayne's World Christians out there. They're like, we're not worthy. We're not worthy. I'm so filthy and dirty. If you could just give me a couple of crumbs, God, blah, 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 blah. And that's not what God wants wants us to do. Do I know I'm not worthy? Yes, I know I'm not worthy, but God wants me to present myself to him approved because I have an understanding of what Jesus Christ has done. I am approved because of the blood of Jesus Christ. I am righteous because of the blood of Jesus Christ. When I come boldly before God's throne of grace, kicking the door in and walking up and telling him what I need or what I want or what I desire in my life. When I do that, I need to be approved. I want to present myself in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, in the royal robes of the king who died in my place and say, God, I'm here today because of what Jesus has done, and I'm approved because of what Jesus has done. A worker who does not need to be ashamed. I don't need to be ashamed of my past. The devil can't accuse me anymore. Go accuse Jesus, devil. He's the one who bore my sin and shame on the cross. Go and choose him. Go accuse him. I'm rightly divided. The word of truth. I found the separation point. The separation point is where Jesus Christ went to the cross. That's where we divide the word of truth. It's no longer, it's not Old Testament and New Testament. That's just the easy way to divide the Bible. Man, we get to the end of the Old Testament, wait 400 years, now we got the New Testament. That's a good way to divide it. It's not chapter by chapter. It's not book by book. It's not verse by verse. It's where Jesus Christ died on the cross. That's where the divide happened. And that's where the divide was bridge. That's where the, the bridge was made so we can go from one side to the other. That's so we can walk 
to God and come boldly before his throne of grace. Because where Jesus died in the Bible is where the new covenant began. And that's where we have to divide God's word. And when we read the Old Testament, because I'm a firm believer in reading the Old Testament, we need to read it through the lens of God's grace and through the new covenant message of the cross. And we need to go back and be like, man, God put this in here so I would see Jesus in the Old Testament. God, God made these sacrifices so I would understand Jesus. God said that the people were righteous based on the blood of the Lamb so that I would understand that I'm righteous based on the blood of the capital L Lamb forever and all eternity. It's about rightly dividing. Orthotomeo. It's only one time in the Bible because there is only one time in the Bible that Jesus Christ died to make you right with God. There's only one time for all eternity that he hung on the cross and did what he needed to do so that he could bring you into his kingdom and make you a joint heir right alongside him to everything that God has ever created. It's only one time and one time for all. So this word only appears one time in the whole Bible because we got to get it right. At one time. I think I'm done. I think I'm out of stuff to say this morning. It's all about Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, teach these things to other people. Present the gospel to a lot more people. And let them enjoy the abundant life that you've been able to enjoy through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for a chance to be here this morning. The opportunity to talk about who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, for the chance to talk about your grace, your love, your kindness, and the fact that we have just been brought into that based on what Jesus did at the cross. God, I pray that uh, those who have been not believing it, that have maybe turned away from it, that have never heard it before, would just open up their, their hearts and their minds this morning and just receive that message that Jesus Christ has already forgiven them, that his blood has washed away their sin, and that he's made them right with you based on his work at the cross, and that they can come boldly before your throne. Just need to believe, confess, and receive the grace that's available in Christ Jesus. Thank you for all of these things. We pray your blessing upon us as we go out into the world. In Christ's name.